Good morning and welcome to Carolina Cares, an iHeartRadio production here on the South Carolina Radio Network. My name is Tyler Ryan, your host. And don't forget, if you'd like to uh, join us on the Facebook social medias, you can look for Carolina Cares Radio. Of course, you can go right to WVOC and click on the podcast tab if you want to go back and listen to other Carolina Cares programs from the past, or certainly this one after you get to hear it. You might want to hear it again and again. And if you have an, an idea or something you'd like to listen to, or maybe appear as a guest on Carolina Cares, you can reach out to me directly. It's Tyler at TylerRyan.com. That's how you get us here at Carolina Care. So happy you're joining us this weekend. And you know, the history of the United States and the state of South Carolina pretty much go hand in hand. Now, of course, there are many places in the original 13 colonies that statement would apply to. But it just seems that as you go through some of the most major events in the forming of this amazing country, South Carolina seems to always play a major role. Now, the Woodby State was made a colony back in nineteen or in 1729, you might remember, or you might remember that from history books. If you were here, I'd like to talk to you, definitely. <laughs> and from that point on, the state seems to play footnotes throughout the tapestry of our country. From the distinction of Camden's role in the Revolution, of course, there was a colonist victory over the Brits and Cowpens. And in fact, let's not forget, just in the whole mix of things, South Carolina was the home of the very first golf course in the country. Just a little fun fact to throw that out for you. Now, of course, there is a dubious distinction that South Carolina was the first state in the Union to secede back in 1861. And of course, the very start, the first fire, shot, shots fired of the war between the North and South beginning at Fort Sumter, just off the coast in Charleston. There was also the burning of the capital city as General Sherman marched through the South in the Civil War. The state has been the home to professional athletes, NASA astronauts, musicians, and at least one president. I say at least because there is some contention. You know, we've seen our worst days with major hurricanes, massive floods, crimes that have left an indelible mark on our collective memories, and other events that some would rather forget than remember. Now, all in all, the state is rich in history, and preserving that history are museums all across the state with the sole mission of ensuring that the history, our past, the good and the bad, are never forgotten. Now, one such museum is the Lexington County Museum in, well, Lexington County. Yeah. Joining us this morning, the curator of all things Lexington County history, J.R. Fennell. Good morning to you, sir. Morning. Great to be here. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. You know, and, and I, I totally can nerd out on history. So uh, hopefully the listeners will will uh, join us and if we can get our historical nerds on for uh, for a few minutes. <laughs> but but, you know, boy, South Carolina really has some interesting, as I said, some interesting footnotes in history, reaching way back even, you know, back to the, the colonial days, this area is a hotbed for things that are that, that make history books. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, you think about the uh, the size of the state, I mean, compared to some of the larger states out there, uh, I mean, we, we have an outsized influence, I think. I mean, you look for, from, like you said, the colonial period all the way to the antebellum period with John C. Calhoun being a major force in national politics, mm-hmm. uh, all the way to the uh, modern day. I mean, really, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we punch above our weight, I think, sometimes. Sure. What, and I've referenced Camden. Camden was the, was it the, it was something, I know, I know that with the revolution, uh, was it the furthest inland battle fought in South Carolina? It was a kind of, uh, important battle. Uh, I believe it was a, uh, Tory victory, unfortunately, mm-hmm. but, uh, a uh, very important battle in the in the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, there was some it went kind of skirmishes. I mean, really, you know, one thing we kind of have to deal with is uh, the difference between a battle and a skirmish. What is it? Uh, I know here in Lexington, there was was what was called the Battle of Terror Springs, and really, I mean, you know, it was more of just a skirmish. A few shots mm-hmm. were fired, nobody was killed, some cattle was stolen. So, you know, okay. if you want to call that a battle. <laughs> so, so that's just like an average uh, family reunion then, right? I mean, that's pretty much. Exactly. Yeah, at least in some parts of the county. Right? <laughs> good, good gracious. But, uh, but yeah, you know, just big things, of course, the tie to the Civil War that uh, we'll never forget that uh, out of history books in Fort Sumter. But, you know, it is very, very cool to to go back and, and have these historical places that you can look at. I mean, gosh, right in the capital of, of South Carolina, the statue of George Washington missing the bottom half of his cane that was taken out by a cannonball. Um, you know, I, I just think there's so many cool things that you can like touch history and go back and see. And I know Lexington is is certainly in the hotbed of, of a lot of the history. I mean, right here, based in the Midlands of the state, we're kind of right in the right in the thick of it, right? 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, uh, um, you know, a lot of people don't kind of think of Lexington as being historical. I mean, a lot of people, if you if you live here, it's, uh, you know, where your home is. But a lot of people, I think, just kind of see Lexington as a suburb of, of Columbia. But the county, I mean, just has its own fascinating history distinct from Columbia. Of course, Columbia has always played a, a big role uh, ever since its founding in Lexington's history. But uh, it, it does have its own unique and, and interesting history. What what is the the history? So you, you know, obviously the cities were formed. And now the original state capital. I'm sure most folks who have been around South Carolina know for a minute uh, that the original state capital, in fact, was Charleston, and it was eventually moved here. Now it was prior to the Civil War, correct? When when Columbia became the capital? Yeah, that was 1786. They, um, you know, one of the kind of things you see during the colonial period is that uh, the power. Uh, political power was held by the planters in the Low Country, mm-hmm. uh, and of course, you know nobody wants to give up political power. So you had, uh, <laughs> you know, people in the back country, farmers and different people, who really started to kind of get angry that they felt that they were not being represented in the colonial government, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so this kind of continued into uh, when South Carolina became a state, the United States was born, uh, and so kind of as a way to. Uh, I think, you know, uh, help mend some wounds and, and help uh, bring together the state, they decided to move the capital to somewhere more centrally located. That way it was a little easier for everybody to get to. Again, you know, this is before cars, this is before trains. Sure. Uh, and so it took, a, it took a while to get anywhere. So that was right. part of it. Absolutely. And and so they picked Columbia, and it makes sense. I mean, it really it really is about if there is a geographical center to the state, it, it, it pretty much is – you know, Columbia. So, and it makes a lot of sense why you'd park your, your state here, especially in the right in those times where you, you couldn't jump in a car and be from Greenville to Charleston in about three or four hours by horse and buggy would take you about a day, I would imagine. Oh yeah. Yeah. And the same thing kind of happened here in Lexington. Uh, the original courthouse and jail were located in a place called Granby, which is basically where modern day Casey is today. Mm -hmm. And the people that lived elsewhere in the county in the Dutch Fork or where modern day Batesburg, Leesville is and those areas, they complained that again, you know, they got called for jury duty or something or even a register of deed, you know, it would take them all you know, all day to get to the courthouse and then all day to get back. So they really wanted somewhere more centrally located and that's how the town of Lexington actually got started was because of that. Right. Now, how how were those original lines formed, the counties, uh, you know, when you've got Lexington, were they pockets of power? Were they, I mean, who who actually drew up the lines of, of any of the counties? Any of, I think we have 46 counties, but any any of the counties, how and when? Because if, if you look at any of our counties, there's some really funny little dog legs. None of them, I think, are very square. They're all, they're all <laughs> like little, little slivers here and there. Yeah, it just kind of, you know, depended on. Um, Sometimes it was based on, um, you know, they had the colonial parishes. Uh, they had, uh, um, you know, kind of colonial counties that were created by um, the uh, British government. Mm-hmm. Sometimes later it was the colonial government, the state government. And then the boundaries have changed, too. Uh, so Lexington originally included all of, you know, what's called the Dutch Fork. So its land included you know, pretty much everything between the Broad and the Saluda River all the way up to Little Mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and starting in the early 20th century, some of the people there decided that they were paying too much in taxes and not getting enough in return. And so they said, well, you know, forget about Lexington. We want to join Richland County. Right. Uh, and so they, they held referendums and everybody voted for it in that area. And so Richland County annexed uh, parts of Lexington. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, other parts of Lexington were lost to the creation of Calhoun County. Uh, Aiken County. So these counties kind of sprang up uh, in the late 19th century. Okay. Kind of wanted, yeah, they wanted their own counties, I guess, you know, for better or worse. Sure. Well, I mean, we did it in 1776. I mean, there is that that uh, that American spirit. Say, darn it, we want representation. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, there, there is that. And of, and of course, yeah, we folks, do it on our own. And, and remember, guys, you know, we're also talking about pre Lake Murray. You know, folks, and, and I do, uh, I'm, a, I'm a boat captain, and I do history tours on Lake Murray all summer long, and I'd be surprised, or you'd be surprised how many people actually are, are from here or have been here a long time, who when I say, guys, the lake is, is you know, less than 100 years old, they're, they're, they're like, what? What do you mean? And so, you know, if you think about the topography of, of the lake where it was, it was just the Saluda River, there was a lot of farmland that was all those, all these places you're referencing, they were all connected by bridges and roads, there wasn't this 
you know, this 14 mile wide, 17 mile long lake that separated these communities either. Exactly. Yeah. And it was a, a major undertaking. I mean, not only in terms of, uh, you know, changing the landscape, but it changed the community. Mm-hmm. And really, I think, um, in some cases, helped to, um, you know, increase the distance that some of the people who live in, like, the Dutch Fork fell from those south of the lake. Uh, before the lake was constructed, uh, you, for the most part, had to use ferries to get across the Saluda River, and that depended a lot on, of course, weather, you know, mm-hmm. were, uh, were there floods, uh, was the river low, was it high, uh, you know, was the ferry available, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then in the early 20th century, a bridge was built um, right where, if you follow in the lake, old Lexington on the Chapin side, or old Chapin Road on the Lexington side, like right where they meet in the middle of the lake uh, was uh, the Wise Ferry Bridge, also called the Steel Bridge, and it was built 1911. And that really was a big deal because it connected, uh, you know, both sides of the river, and you didn't have to really depend on ferries anymore after that. Right. And and just an interesting note for scuba divers, if you're, you're looking, wherever you are in the state, if you're looking for an interesting dive, uh, the, the Wise Ferry Bridge is still down there. Uh, it's it's quite deep. It's an advanced dive, but you can certainly get down. It's dark, but you can actually still go down and, and see that bridge. And that's and I've done that dive. And that's kind of a cool, you know, thing in history to, as well to go down and think about that, you know, this thing that's uh, you know, 120 feet underwater was was that mecca that connection between between Shapen and, and Lexington or you know it, it's crazy yeah and I've seen some of the videos I've ever uh, went down myself mm-hmm. but, uh, you know kind of spooky just kind of seeing this bridge appear in the darkness right yeah, well, it's also known as Lake Murky, but that's a whole different conversation altogether. <laughs> but so, so kind of walk us through a little bit, a, a, you know, five minute history of, of Lexington. So it's formed, uh, you know, you've obviously it's kind of morphed and it's left. The original the original seat was over in the Granby area. Kind of what happens? I know there's there's some key names. There's, there's names that we all know. We drive down through the streets like anywhere in, in South Carolina, probably anywhere. Uh, you know, you've got certain family names that you recognize because they're the main drags, you know. But kind of walk us through a little bit of the history of how, how our county, how that county became. Yeah. Um, so really, uh, the uh, history of Lexington kind of goes back to the colonial period. And, and really, the state of South Carolina, or the colony of South Carolina, I should say, um, went through a period of time uh, where they really started to worry about their borders. Uh, so you had some of the Native American tribes, the Cherokee, the Creek, that were out there that the colonists were somewhat fearful of. Uh, and, of course, this is during that uh, kind of colonial expansion time period when the Spanish were you know, still an enemy of England, and so the Spanish tried to attack South Carolina several times. Right. Now, they were, uh, there, was, there was influence out of Florida, right? Is that where they came up from the Florida yeah. area? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they really wanted to try to protect their borders and protect the plantations in the low country. Uh, and, of course, Charleston, where you know, the city government was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what they decided to do was to create what they call townships. And so these townships uh, were areas of land that were no longer inhabited by Native Americans in the back country, where they would open it up for settlement and try to attract uh, a lot of uh, Protestants from Germany, Switzerland, um, you know, Scotland, and England, hmm. and really try to get them to uh, settle in the back country and provide um, protection from, you know, provide a buffer basically uh, from the Native Americans uh, and the uh, the Spanish, and the French, and also to try to balance the population out a little more. At this time, this is when they were uh, importing a lot of African slaves. And so they wanted to try to get the white population up as well. So yeah. Lexington started off as one of those townships that was called Saxagotha at the time. And uh, it was uh, um, mainly settled by uh, Swiss Germans and Germans. So these were people, uh, Germanic heritage. And a lot of the people that came from Germany came from the kind of southwestern part of Germany, what's now called Baden-Württemberg State. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting because they brought with them a lot of their traditions. So they brought with them their, you know, kind of taste in food. Uh, they brought with them their religion. That's why there's a lot of Lutheran churches in Lexington today. And uh, it's very interesting to know they brought with them some of their superstitions. So they believed in witches. They believed in ghosts. They believed in this uh, kind of magic called using. I mean, it's very fascinating. Mm. 
And so, and and actually, if you if you notice, there are, and to, to your point, I mean, there are German fests. I know Columbia has them. I know around the state, there's German fests, and you can really see this big this big culture, this big population of of, of ancestry that's there. Yeah, absolutely. And you, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, a lot of these uh, big family names that you think of when you see Lexington, the Harmons, the Kaufmans, the Sheelys, uh, a lot of those names are from Germany, German-derived names. Harmon was originally Hermann. Uh, Sheely was originally Shula. Kaufman wow. was originally Kaufman. So it's very interesting to see this kind of transformation and Anglic- Anglicization of these sure. names. Speaking this morning on Carolina Cares with uh, with Jared Fennell, you were the the curator and the director of the the Lexington County uh, Museum of History over in uh, in Lexington. Uh, just kind of just I, I, like I said earlier, I love to talk and just kind of just learn how things morphed into to what the present day. I've, I've lived I've lived in the area for about gosh coming up almost almost twenty years at this point. My goodness, and uh, you know even I can see a lot of those changes. And I look back when I got here, I'm like, wow, it, it I can't imagine you know multiply that several times to to go back to that 200 years so so we get to say um you know, get to say like the civil wars we've got kind of this the the townships are in place things are things are there we're trying to defend against the spanish or uh, against american indians you know whoever else the role i mean obviously the midlands specifically but the whole south played a major role in the civil war as well but sherman coming through marching through and burning the entire city that that kind of stuff what, let's talk a little bit about that yeah so uh sherman before he made his way to Columbia, he came through Lexington County. Uh, they entered uh, the county, I believe, on Valentine's Day, 1865, February 14th, and crossed the Edisto. Um, and it, it's very interesting. I'm not a military historian, but, uh, you know, I think strategically it was, it was very fascinating because Sherman actually split his army uh, when he left Savannah, trying to confuse the Confederates about which way he was going to go. Uh, some people thought that he was going to try to go to Charleston, which is, uh, like you mentioned, the kind of cradle of secession where Fort Sumter happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and others thought he was going to go to Augusta. And there was a powder manufacturing factory there, important seat on the Savannah River. Uh, and so he split his army and, of course, went to neither and decided to go to Columbia. Uh, and so he uh, confused everybody pretty much <laughs> right. and uh, made, his, made his way through Lexington. Um, the, it's interesting to, to read uh, some of the accounts by soldiers, by those who um, were witnesses here, uh, and uh, you know some of the soldiers that served in Sherman's army uh, it really kind of talked about how the land was very barren. Uh, they called it a, a pine barren of the worst sort, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think they saw nothing but sand and pine trees, so they really did uh, <laughs> They didn't like that too much. So. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So they but, uh, Sherman. Now, did they do? I mean, obviously they burned Columbia. Was there damage done in Lexington of note? Was that uh, is that anything that occurred? Yeah, they burned the courthouse, uh, the jail, parts of uh, Main Street, and uh, St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in mm-hmm. Lexington as well. Uh, there were houses that did survive that uh, you know that were built before the Civil War, but uh, uh, but a lot of Lexington was burned by Sherman. As as they came through, interesting. So you get you of course get through that. We get to the uh, you know we all know how the war ended. We get to the Reconstruction period. Get into the industrial age, and really things start clicking uh, in the entire state for sure. I mean, really become a, a mecca for for industry. Columbia is exploding. It's a center. You've got the you've got the railway because everything comes into Columbia and flows out of Columbia to no matter where you are in the state at that point. Um, you know you've got the construction of Lake Murray to create hydropower. And that really, that really kind of marks a, a whole big turning period, doesn't it? It, it really does. Uh, you know, one of the things that you see uh, in Lexington in particular, in Lexington County, is the arrival of the railroad after the uh, Civil War. So there was no railroad in the county uh, before the war. And uh, after the war, uh, really starting in 1868, 1869, the Columbia to Augusta Railroad was completed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, really that kind of helped spur, uh, helped spur business and allowed people to to get uh, goods from out of state much easier. They could, uh, you know, order them through catalogs, use catalogs, get it on the train, mm-hmm. uh, and allow for faster travel. Um, and you also saw the building of other railroads. Of course, there was the uh, uh, one that went from Columbia down to Pelion, uh, Columbia to Swansea. Uh, you also had the CN and L Railroad, which uh, went through Irmo and Chapin, uh, which stood for the Columbia, Newberry, and Lawrence Railroad. 
But a lot mm-hmm. of people around here apparently nicknamed it the Crooked, Noisy, and Lake Train. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And how did that all connect to, like, say, over towards the Grand Strand and down into Charleston in the, in the upstate, the Greenville area? Was, was there this connection forming between all these, I say pockets, because if you don't have trains, they might as well be a million miles away. Um, you know, is that all really starting to connect at that point? Yeah, um, you know, Charleston, of course, being the port city, really was where, you know, they were importing these goods uh, from other other states, other parts of the country, from Europe, uh, and uh, of course, then they could easily make it uh, to Lexington or other places in the state uh, mm-hmm. via railroad. So it really opened up. Uh, you know, you didn't have to depend so much on locally made goods. You could buy some of these products for much cheaper because the transportation costs were much, much lower. Right, right. I just, it, it's so interesting. J.R. Fennell from the Lexington County Museum. So let's talk a little bit about, about since we've spent some time on, you know, tying in the whole state, but, you know, this morning we were talking about Lexington County. You've got a museum there. Tell me a little bit about what folks can expect when they go and, and come, go to Lexington and visit this, this, little, this little jewel of history. Well, we've got 30 historic structures on six and a half acres in downtown Lexington. And, and really what we try to do is interpret everyday life uh, in Lexington County from the colonial period all the way to the start of the Civil War. Uh, and so we do that through uh, these historic structures that really tell a story. Um, you know, we also have period furniture uh, that was made and used here in Lexington, uh, a large textile collection, so quilts. Uh, clothing. We also have pottery uh, mm-hmm. and uh, even firearms that were made here in Lexington. Wow. So we really try to, you know, let people experience, you know, kind of a, a way of life that has gone uh, mm-hmm. forever. When you're talking about a museum, whether it's Newberry County or Horry County or wherever, Charleston County, you uh, in Lexington County, where are you getting these artifacts, these things? I mean, obviously, you know, we're trying to tie it into the local area, so it makes sense. You're going to have Newberry originated stuff in a lot of cases, um, Lexington and whatnot. Are you getting these from families or left in estates? I mean, where, where does a museum start gathering its collection? Yeah, it, uh, um, it, it kind of has a, a variety of different sources. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, we get phone calls from people that, uh, you know, have fairly family heirlooms, uh, stuff that, uh, you know, they may not have room for, they're downsizing, or maybe just want, you know, they want to have it taken care of, but they don't necessarily want to keep it anymore. Um, so we get things from local family members. Sometimes it's family members who have moved away, mm-hmm. uh, even sometimes for several generations. Um, but we also acquire artifacts through auctions, estate sales, uh, sometimes antique stores. Just you know, we are, we're always on the lookout for things that we we would want and need, and, mm-hmm. and help better tell a story about you know Lexington and the colonial and antebellum period. How do you? How does a curator or somebody, a, you know, collector of, of these things? What kind of work Jer goes into ensuring? I mean, obviously, the, and and you are open. You want to point out that that the Lexington County Museum is open for the public. Uh, with I know you're practicing all the COVID practices, and I know that that's all in place. Um, so that is one place you can go and, and experience. But how do you, when you have the general public, COVID notwithstanding, moving about these these items that are. 200 years old that are, you know, are irreplaceable at this point. Um, what kind of work on your day-to-day basis do you go through to ensure that everything stays safe, secure, catalog, not stolen, etc.? Yeah, so uh, when people come for a tour, um, you are not allowed to enter the historic structures without a tour guide with you. Uh, and uh, so this uh, allows us to really, you know, keep an eye on people. Again, you know, we trust people, but we do know that, uh, you know, the, uh, things happen, and, and there are also some uh, people who maybe have some not so nice motives out there. So sure. this allows us to uh, just, you know, help ensure the safety of the object so that we don't have people touching things, picking them up, maybe breaking them, uh, or even taking them. Mm-hmm. Um, we also clean quite often, uh, and the structures that we have. Uh, most of the important artifacts, the ones that are, um, you know, we really want to ensure the, the safety and preservation of, they're in buildings that have you know, heating and air, and we control the humidity as well. Because okay. that's really, you know, what can damage, you know, a piece of furniture is like when there's these fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really, you know, try to ensure that uh, they're in a, a stable environment, I guess. 
I keep uh, I keep losing you just a little bit, Jr. I'm not sure if you're moving the phone about. I know we're we're on phones these days for interviews, but I keep losing you just a little bit. I want to make sure folks can hear you, okay? Um, but but your job really is to make sure that that everything, even when there's not people in there, that you just keep an eye on and 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 catalog and and clean and and keep fresh all these these artifacts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we when we get an artifact uh, coming in. We uh, catalog it. We try to take down as much information as we can uh, and record it. And we also do what's called a condition recording. So we try to uh, document the condition so that we can keep watch on it to really see, you know, is you know if it has any you know, cracks or if it has some deterioration, is it getting worse? Mm-hmm. That way, if it is, we can try to, you know, uh, fix it or, or at least stop the, the deterioration. Sure. Now, do you guys? I know. I know that some museums, just like zoos. There'll be there'll be traveling artifacts. There'll be traveling collections. Do you you know as as you are looking at you're a you're a county museum and in one county and there's 46 of them out there. I'm not sure if every county has a museum, but I I know several do. Uh, you may know that. But do you I mean do you come across maybe something that maybe is is tied to you know say Aiken County, Horry County, Charleston County? Do you do you have a colleague a, a mirror down there and you call and go, hey man, I've got I came across this this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know the the museums. We, uh, in South Carolina, a lot of them are part of an organization called the South Carolina Federation of Museums. And so we talk uh, and you know, try to really share information. And if there's something that gets offered to us, an artifact or a document, something like that, and, you know, really it's from you know, Horry County or, or Georgetown, you know, we will try to steer that artifact towards that museum, you know, right. tell the, the donor that, hey, there's a, you know, we probably shouldn't take it, but there's a museum, you know, right down the road that would love to have it. So we try to help each other out. Sure. So any of the counties that folks go to, you really, if you're looking for your your lineage or just you want to learn about a, you know, about a Georgetown or a county, you're really going to walk into that museum. Whereas the South Carolina State Museum is just that. There are amazing artifacts. I'm a huge fan of the South Carolina State Museum. But if you go to your county museum, those are really going to be specifically towards that area. If you want to learn about your family's heritage or just the area in general, then those local museums are the ones that are really going to give you that that little extra goose, right? Absolutely, yeah. And a lot of times, I mean, the curators, the employees there will be knowledgeable of family history. So if you're you know doing genealogical research, they can try to help you as much mm-hmm. as, as they can uh, and maybe even show you artifacts related to your family as well. That is fantastic. J.R. Fennell, tell me again where the uh, where the museum is. So folks, if they're coming, if they're in Lexington or they're coming through Lexington, can can stop by and pay a visit. Yeah, so we're located at 231 Fox Street in Lexington, uh, and this is right off of Highway 378 Columbia Avenue. Uh, we're somewhat hidden um, behind some of the businesses here, but we're right behind Michaelis Mattress, uh, Lexington Paint and Flooring, Napa Auto Parts, right in that stretch. Uh, and uh, we have adequate parking for everybody. And, and uh, you know, our phone number, if you can't find us or just want to call for more information, is 803-359-8369. But we would love to have people come out and take a tour with us. What is the cost for admission? It is $5 for adults and $2 for children. Five whole dollars. Those are like like library fees. It's not really that much to get in and take, and take a, a walk through history for sure. <laughs> yeah, we try to keep it as reasonable as possible. Man, I appreciate what you do for history. Your knowledge, I, I could sit and talk history all day long. Uh, you know, of course, I live in Lexington, so I've got a special ear out for for things that. But uh, you know, if you wherever you are, what museum history is something you can't replace, and you know, you can't be rewritten. It, it's just there, and it. I, I think we all should learn and and just take a walk back in time. You can, like Marty McFly, you can do it, and you don't have to get into a DeLorean to do it either. Right. There it is. Absolutely. <laughs> J.R. Fennell, the Lexington County Museum this morning, our guest on Carolina Cares. I'll put links up if you want to catch us on the social media. You can do that. Uh, just look for Carolina Cares Radio. That's on Facebook. And, of course, uh, you can get the podcast if you go to WVOC.com and you click on podcast. You can listen to this show again or the other uh, Carolina Cares shows. If you'd like to be a guest or have an idea, a topic from your community, wherever you are in the Palmetto State, please drop me an email. It's Tyler at Tyler Ryan. Dot com and we'll get folks on. And of course, uh, thank you so much for listening to Carolina Cares. It is an iHeartMedia production, and we are here on the South Carolina Radio Network broadcasting from our flagship, WVOC in Columbia. Once again, my name is Tyler Ryan. Thank you so much for joining us, and I will speak with you in seven days.